in your packet there are some forms. One of those forms is uh, for membership in the Houston Trial Lawyers Association, of which I'm a member, uh, and many of the people in the room are members. Uh, also, uh, there is a form in the pack in the black bag that uh, Summit Pharmacy gave us, a form for the Houston Trial Lawyers, Houston Trial Attorneys, Harris County Democratic Trial Lawyers. Harris County Democratic Lawyers Association. Harris County Democratic Lawyers Association, of which I'm also a member. Uh, and uh, we do have the real president of that organization, uh, Tim Riley. Tim is also a very, very experienced plaintiff's attorney. Uh, originally was with Butler Binion, went out on his own, uh, formed a firm, uh, and now uh, uh, has been practicing on the plaintiff's side for 20 years? 12. 12. And uh, has an uh, excellent reputation, board certified, and uh, is going to tell you about some of the upcoming events. For instance, uh, tomorrow at noon, there is a luncheon for the Harris County Democratic Lawyers Association. And he'll tell you about that, and I'd encourage you to go to that also especially the judicial candidates ought to come to that. And uh, uh, it's a real honor to introduce Tim, who I've known 30 years, excellent attorney and very active uh, on a number of things in the, in the Houston community. Besides the uh, Democratic Party, he also is given of his time. In fact, he just came from a grievance uh, committee that he chairs and uh, does lots and lots of things for the community. So, uh, Tim Ryan. Thank you. Uh, before I start, I will tell you about our uh, HCDLA event tomorrow. George Barnstone is our vice president, he's here as well. And Barbara Gardner is uh, on our board of directors, uh, as is Jim Peacock, who's here. And uh, anyway, we have a lot of members here. It's a great organization, been around since 2003. Mark Whitehead, who just spoke, was the first president. And then Lee Arlano for the last uh, seven years. I've been the president for the last year. Um, you know, you don't have to come out as a Democrat if you don't want to to join. It's just a great organization, although I think we all are Democrats in the organization. Um, we meet once a month uh, at a luncheon from September through May. Uh, you get an hour of approved CLE for free, pay $25 for the luncheon. If you join, the dues are only $75 a year, and you get one free uh, uh, luncheon per year for that $75. We also have some really good events. Uh, during the year, we have our annual Clarence Darrow Award uh, that we have given for the last nine years. There's an incredible uh, uh, group of people that have received that award. Started with Jim Purdue Sr., uh, Professor David Dow of the Texas Innocence Project has been a recipient, Sissy Farenthold, who has been a pioneer in, in uh, particular women's politics in the state of Texas, Fermencio Reyes Jr., uh, Anthony Griffin, Craig Watkins, the district attorney of Dallas County. This year, our recipient is uh, State Senator Wendy Davis, who I know everybody here is familiar with. Uh, she was, we were scheduled to do this two weeks ago, and of course her father got critically ill and we had to, uh, to uh, cancel or postpone it. Her campaign has promised we'll have it back in another seven weeks. So you get to go to that for free, and we also have uh, some other nice events during the year for free. It's a great organization, www.hcdla.com. I'd encourage you to, uh, to join. Um, I was asked about topics that I thought would be appropriate for this seminar today. And one of the things that's intrigued me is, as both a lawyer and as a, uh, I guess, a legal educator, I've been a law professor off and on for a long time, and as a commentator on the law, is the evolution of the term proximate cause in the state of Texas. Uh, because as you read the cases, I think it becomes quite confusing. Uh, where the courts have been and where they're going with proximate cause. So I, I thought it would be a good topic, first because it would force me to sit down and go over the law and the history of the development of proximate cause. I know people don't like a history lesson, but I think it's important in this context because if you do any kind of trial work, proximate cause is something you're going to have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, and you really need to know where the courts have been going with proximate cause in order to protect your case, and I don't care if you're a plaintiff or a defendant, it doesn't really matter. You need to know what these issues are as the courts have done them. And as you look at it, you know, I looked at it, I thought, well, you know, proximate cause started really narrowly, 
then it kind of expanded like a balloon. Now it's gone back down to a very narrow uh, definition of proximate cause. Uh, it's not the same proximate cause that I was taught as a young lawyer. Hopefully I can make this work right. Okay, these are the non-legal definitions. I kind of started there because I didn't, you know, really know kind of what the term proximate means. Uh, it comes from Latin proximus or proximatus, some people say, meaning nearest, next, or near. Oxford says it's an adjective in the adjective form. It can be a verb also, uh, meaning closest in space or time or approximate as either definition. And then uh, Merriam-Webster says it means uh, immediately preceding or very near. I was curious as to where it began. And the reason my curiosity uh, got uh, provoked with this one, I started thinking about a factual scenario that uh, you read about in the paper every once in a while. I want you to imagine a young 26-year-old law school graduate who is studying for the bar exam and gets frustrated with his studies for the bar exam. It's cloudy, it's in the early, late afternoon, early evening. It's overcast, but the weather isn't terrible, so he decides to go out for a jog uh, to get his mind off studying for the bar exam. And as he's running along on a, side, on a public sidewalk in front of a private residence, a sudden storm blows up, and it's a horrendous storm. Uh, it's a squall, the skies get completely black. There are wind gusts of 55 to 60 miles per hour. And as it didn't, wasn't that way when he started out, but it's that way when he's on his run. And all of a sudden, a 100-year-old oak tree on private property falls down and pins the young lawyer uh, next to a car. Would have killed him if the car hadn't been there. And he ends up a permanent paraplegic as a result of that. As it turns out, the homeowner had been concerned about the uh, status of the tree as well, mostly because concern as to whether the tree would fall on his house or his own children. And so he had hired a tree company to come and inspect the tree. And the tree company had come and inspected the tree. And the tree company had looked at it and said, you know, in our opinion, uh, this tree appears to be sound and does not need to be taken down, which he was obviously very relieved to hear. Who's at fault? Where's the proximate cause in this? Is the homeowner is his negligence in allowing the tree to be there a proximate cause? Is it reasonably foreseeable that the tree might blow down and hit a jogger passing by on the street? Is the tree company who gave their opinion as to the status of the tree, was there, were they negligent and was that a proximate cause? Was it reasonably foreseeable? And let's not forget about the jogger. If he'd have checked the weather forecast that day, he would have known that there was a warning of severe thunderstorms. Was, his, was he negligent? And was that a proximate cause of his own injuries? Uh, this is where the earliest use of proximate cause was. It comes to us from the English common law. And they started talking about it in the English cases very early. Uh, but it's difficult to get any definition out of it. I, I didn't include the definition here, and the reason I didn't is because it's pretty vague. It's things, that cause which most reasonable people would think was a cause of the event. Uh, Sir Francis Bacon kind of had the first, in 1596, I told you this is a little bit of a history lesson. He kind of had the first uh, uh, written thing on proximate cause that was taken in Maxims of the Law. And he said that the law would only consider an act or event a legal or proximate cause if it is the nearest cause, uh, injuria non remota causus et proxima spectator, that's my best Latin imitation, or in law, one looks to the near cause, not the remote one. I think the interesting thing about that is uh, that he's only looking at one cause. So whatever is the nearest cause to the event, the injury event, or the, the damaging event, is what Bacon would have considered the only proximate cause of the event. <coughs> And that was followed for quite a time. Um, let's see. Okay, then we had Sir Isaac Newton. Now, you don't think of him as a lawyer, and he, he wasn't. Uh, 1687, he published a tome. Uh, I'm not going to try that one, but it's a mathematics book. And, but he looked at, from a physics standpoint, from a math standpoint, what can we look at as the actual cause of the event? And Sir Isaac Newton says, look, it's not the nearest cause, it's a thing that set it in motion. It's a kinetic energy that started the event. Uh, that was widely accepted, uh, and we started seeing an evolution in the term proximate cause. 
So no longer were they looking at the closest cause, but what was the real cause that set the thing in event. Uh, but again, it was only one cause. It couldn't be a concurrent cause or a contributing cause. Uh, in 1841, that began to erode first in England. I won't go over all these, uh, these quotes and cases, but uh, I'll make the uh, PowerPoint available if anybody has an academic uh, interest in it. Uh, and it ta started talking about, well, wait a minute, why can we just have one cause of an event? Why can't there be multiple causes of an event? The earliest case I could find in the United States that adopted that context uh, was in 1847 in New York, and a man chases a boy through the street and into a shop. Uh, the boy runs into a wine cask and knocks a faucet off the wine cask. Somebody was injured or damaged. Uh, the court said, look, even though the injury was not the necessary consequence, the wrong done by the defendant, this is the man chasing the boy, the wrong was of such a nature that it might very naturally result in an injury to some third person. Hey, and so as we look from that point forward, three interesting uh, uh, concepts started to evolve. The first was, can, we've talked about briefly, can there be two or more legal causes? And the answer is yes, and we're gonna talk about this in a little bit more detail in a second. So long as it can be said that but for each act, the event would not have occurred. And you're gonna think in just a minute when I talk about some examples of well, how can you say that about two concurrent causes? Because if but for one, the event would not have occurred, then how can you say that the second but for that event, it wouldn't have occurred because if the first guy hadn't been negligent, it wouldn't have occurred and never would have come up. Uh, the next thing is, what is the relationship between the act and the resulting occurrence necessary before the former can be recognized as a legal cause of the latter? And I think it's pretty clear in, in discerning the cases that foreseeability of the consequence, and, and again, we're going to talk about that in some detail because that's kind of the key to this, is the, uh, is the determining factor. How foreseeable was the damage or the injury as a result of the act uh, from the perspective of an objective person uh, so we can look at it as a causative effect. And if that, if that is the key, is, is it a necessary element of recognition of a duty or a necessary element to establish proximate cause? And that is kind of where the courts, we start to see, at, at least uh, I see some more gray here, here, here besides mine. That's what we've seen evolution of the proximate cause in, uh, in Texas over the last 25 or 30 years. And it depends on whose ox is being gored. It depends on what the Court of Appeals wants to do with it. Um, there were two schools of thought that developed. Uh, first was foreseeability is an element of duty which must be decided by the court. And I'm going to talk about how they came up with that. And then the second was foreseeability is an element of causation which must be decided by the jury. Uh, I can tell you from a plaintiff's perspective which one of those I like a lot better. Uh, the second one, that foreseeability is an element of causation which must be decided by the jury. This is going to take you back to your law school days, the Paul's Graph versus Long Island Railroad case, uh, 1928. And uh, actually, I thought I remembered that case until so I went back and read it, and I, I really didn't remember it all. But in any event, there's two boys running alongside a railroad track. The train is leaving, and one of the employees of the train, of the railroad, uh, reaches up and pulls one up. When he does, the, guy, the, the young man drops a package that he's carrying. It falls on the track. It's full of fireworks. They're going to do some kind of a prank. It explodes, and some distance away, they don't define how some distance, but some distance away, a scale is knocked over as a result of this explosion, and the scale falls on the plaintiff and injures the plaintiff. She, of course, does not sue the boy. Uh, she sues the, uh, the railroad. There was a charge that, and I, I found this quite interesting, uh, because it, this charge doesn't have much delineation on what is proximate cause. It says, if they omitted to do the things which prudent and careful trainmen do for the safety of those who are boarding their trains, as well as the safety of those who are standing upon the platform waiting for the other trains, and that the failure resulted in the plaintiff's injury, then the defendant would be liable. And what I think is interesting is all they're saying is that the failure resulted in the plaintiff's injury. It's not exciting, efficient, or uh, contributing cause. There's no definition that we would have approximate cause. They just simply ask the jury, if that failure resulted in the plaintiff's injury, then the defendant would be liable. The majority opinion is written by Benjamin Cardozo, and this is the one that is uh, most remembered. Justice Cardozo held that foreseeability is an element of duty, not an element of proximate cause. Uh, and here he says, the risk to the uninvolved passenger of helping the boy on the train was not foreseeable to the fellow that helped him up, 
Therefore, he had no duty to avoid. And this is a famous quote that, uh, that I've actually used in briefs before. The risk reasonably to be perceived defines the duty uh, to be obeyed. The more interesting thing, though, is the dissent by Justice Andrews. And Justice Andrews says, no, we really ought to be looking at this in a proximate cause context. And he says, everyone owes to the world at large the duty of refraining from those acts that may unreasonably threaten the safety of others. The actor is liable to anyone who is foreseeably injured, even if he is outside the zone of what would be, uh, or generally be thought the danger zone. But there is one limitation. And I thought this was important because you'll see in his dissent that the, the, uh, the germ of all of the Texas cases that we've seen that have limited proximate cause. Uh, he says the damages must be so connected with the negligence that the latter may be said to be the proximate cause of the former, okay? The proximate cause must be at the least something without which the event would not happen, the but-for element, okay? Then he says the court must ask itself, obviously he's looking at it from a legal perspective as opposed to a jury perspective, the, even though he's looking at proximate cause. The court must ask, ask itself whether there was a natural and continuous sequence between cause and effect. Was the, the one a substantial factor in producing the other? And the Texas Supreme Court has really seized on this language without giving credit to uh, just, uh, Justice Andrews. Was there a direct connection between them without too many intervening causes? Texas Supreme Court has seized on that, again, without giving Justice Andrews recognition. Is the effect of cause and result not too attenuated? Again, same thing, Texas courts have relied on, on uh, that question in other instances. Is the cause likely in the usual judgment of mankind to produce the result, or by the exercise of prudent foresight, could the result have been foreseen? Is it too remote from the cause? And here we consider remoteness of time and space, the attenuation argument which Texas Supreme Court has seized on. Uh, but he still would have affirmed, and he would have affirmed on the basis of the failure of the defense to request a foreseeability instruction on proximate cause. Uh, we started to see, I'm going to jump forward to Texas because I think you're most interested in that and I could probably go a lot longer today than I would be allowed. We started to see an age of enlightenment in Texas uh, about the time that uh, Mr. Schechter and I started practicing law. Uh, the court started to recognize a duty to prevent as a potential proximate cause despite the absence of an act setting kinetic energy in motion. And that's something, I do a lot of plaintiff's medical malpractice work. And before that, I did a lot of defense medical malpractice work. We often face the issue of, okay, can you cause something if all you do is prevent the harm from occurring? Can that be a cause, a legal cause of an event? And the answer was really no at one point in time, although that has been evolving. But in 1881, the Texas Supreme Court said, yeah, we're gonna do that. And it arose, interestingly, in the context of a complete bar of negligence uh, as to a plaintiff who was standing on a railroad track when he was injured. And they said, look, if the plaintiff was injured and he was on the railroad track due to his own negligence, that's too direct cause. Therefore, the engineer's negligence and failure to stop can't be a proximate cause as a matter of law. But if the plaintiff, and that's what happened in this case, the evidence was that the plaintiff was either drunk or had some kind of a psychotic disorder and he fell asleep on the track through no fault of his own. And this is where the court said, wait a minute, if the plaintiff went on the track at a time when no danger was imminent through no fault of his own, thus became insensible and capable of removing himself, the engineer's negligence in failing to prevent the harm became the direct cause and the plaintiff's act is too remote to be considered a proximate cause because a providential dispensation broke the causal connection between the plaintiff's act and her injury. And that's been very important to civil trial lawyers is failure to prevent concept, and that's, I believe that's where it emanated from the first case I could find anyway historically where the Texas Supreme Court had addressed failure to prevent as a, as a proximate cause. And they specifically said it's solely for the jury to determine whether the plaintiff was drunk when laying on the tracks or had a fit and whether the engineer negligently failed to stop. Uh, we recognize the concurrent cause doctrine in 1889 and this is a really, I won't go bore you with the details, but it's a really interesting case where they had stretched a rope across a, a bayou and then a tug uh, hits it and causes an injury. And the tugboat drivers say, hey, wait a minute, we yelled at these guys that there was a rope across there. We couldn't be at fault. And the guys on the ground said, well, they negligently put a rope across the bayou. Now how could we be at fault for failing to stop that? And the court said, look, uh, they could have sued either one or both of them. 
And you can have a situation where both are responsible. Now note, this is pretty far back, and this is in the 1800s, that we start recognizing the concurrent cause doctrine in Texas. Uh, I thought that quote was interesting. It, a jury may be able to say uh, that hailing with a human voice, a steam tug and motion from the bank of a navigable stream to prevent it from running upon an unseen obstruction is equivalent to and dispenses with the use of a warning light. It was not proper to, do, to so declare in this case as a matter of law. So the, the Supreme Court is holding that, hey, it can be two causes and it's purely for the jury to decide this is not a legal issue. Uh, mid 1980s, I started practicing in 83, uh, we had the Nixon versus Mr. Property Management. And this, I'm going to come back to this in a later case with a different result in just a minute. This is a case where Dallas had an ordinance saying that if you had a vacant apartment, you had to put a lock on it. And they didn't really explain why you had to do that, but somebody was abducted, they were taken into a vacant apartment, and they were sexually assaulted. They sued the apartment owner and claimed negligence per se for violating this ordinance. The Texas Supreme Court said, look, uh, there's a light burden on the issue of duty, foreseeability. And it's established here by the fact that the ordinance was violated, but it could be established in any number of ways. Uh, they looked at what we later know are the timber walk factors. Was there enough uh, violent accidents, uh, acts in that area so that this act was reasonably foreseeable on the proximate cause element? And they said there was, and they were entitled to the trial to the uh, trial. Uh, in 1987, uh, they take, the Texas Supreme Court takes a big step forward, and I'm, uh, I don't want to say proud, but uh, I am kind of proud. I was a plaintiff's lawyer, a three-year lawyer on this case uh, for uh, Mr. Poole. It was the first dram shop case in Texas, and the question was, you know, it's hard to believe that before 1987, we didn't have dram shop liability in any form in the state of Texas. And uh, the judge here granted summary judgment to the defense. We took it up to the, uh, I believe we went to the Corpus Christi Court of Appeals. We won, they took it to the Supreme Court and we won 9-0 there as well. It was a short-lived victory. Um, but they said, look, there's a statutory duty not to serve alcohol to an intoxicated person. And the preamble to the Texas Alcoholic Beverage Code says that this is to protect the citizens of the state of Texas. There's the duty, there's the foreseeability established in the statute itself. Approximate cause the defense was, and they were using this all around the United States. It's not approximate cause because it's not reasonable foreseeable and you have the intervening act of the driver who gets behind the wheel. Uh, that breaks the approximate cause chain between the dram shop's negligence and the injuries uh, to the third party. Uh, the Texas Supreme Court, Franklin Spears wrote the opinion, says the determination of proximate intervening case, uh, cause and cases for this rest on the jury as in any other action grounded in negligence. Concurrent causation can be decided by the jury and while the jury may find a licensee's conduct is not the proximate cause, the in inter inquiry should be made on a case by case basis, not a rule of law uh, denying recovery in all cases. Uh, for the second half of the story, we actually uh, got two days of trial and settled this case. Uh, after the uh, case was remanded. Uh, I'm not going to go through this, but if you read the El Chico opinion, I really have to applaud Justice Spears. Uh, he really wrote, a, I think, a brilliant opinion, and it's just, it's, uh, his, it's very eloquent. Uh, I like the, the end, and he's not the only one that's ever used this quote. He talks about the fact that uh, this is a common law, this is a little bit of a side trip, I guess. Says that, look, when we create bad law, it's our job as the courts to correct it. We can't sit around and wring our hands and say, oh, it's the legislature, oh, the law contracts, there's nothing we can do. When the ghosts of the past stand in the path of justice clanking their medieval chains, the proper course for the judge is to pass through them undeterred. Uh, this is where things started changing. 1991, Lear Siegler versus uh, Bettis. Uh, this is, it was kind of an interesting case and you kind of wish it hadn't come up in this context, but anyway, Mr. Bettis is driving a truck with an arrow sign behind it to warn traffic. He stops in the highway, reasons nobody knows. He gets out, and when he does, Mr. Letterman is driving down the highway, same direction, Mr. Letterman falls asleep. He runs into the back of the sign. The sign comes and hits Bettis and kills Bettis on the side of the road. He can't say why, because he's dead, but he can't say why uh, he did, but they had evidence that the sign had been malfunctioning, and they believe that there was some evidence that uh, the sign had malfunctioned, so they sued under products liability and negligence against the sign manufacturer. Uh, the Court of Appeals agreed there was a fact issue, but the Supreme Court said it doesn't matter. 
it says, look, uh, if, if the, the sign being defective, assuming it was, it was not a sufficiently substantial factor in causing the injury to be, be deemed a proximate cause as a matter of law. They're saying, look, uh, even if the jury were to find, we're going to look at proximate cause, we're going to say that as a matter of law, we're not going to let the jury get this case because they don't want it to. Then it gets darker in Union Pump Company versus Albright in 1995. There's, there's obviously some changes on the court at this point. This is a fire at a plant caused by a leaky pump. Fire is extinguished, but there's water everywhere. A, walker, uh, a worker walks over a wet pipe rack, slips and falls. He sues the pump manufacturer under negligence theory saying, hey, wait a minute. If your negligent pump hadn't gotten this wet, then I never would have fallen. Therefore, your negligence is a cause. Uh, the Texas Supreme Court says no. They said a legal cause is not established if the defendant's conduct or product does no more than furnish the condition that makes the plaintiff's injury possible. Now, I got to tell you, I've never really understood what they mean by that. It seems to me that that's every negligence case, uh, unless you know you take a knife and cut off somebody's leg. It almost always is the event that all you've done is create the condition. You usually did not physically cause harm, particularly in a failure to prevent case like this one. But what they're saying is we're not going to let the jury determine proximate cause, nor are we going to allow the Court of Appeals to weigh the evidence supporting the jury verdict. So the Supreme Court is wanting to move toward a situation where we don't really want that Court of Appeals looking at it because they have to indulge in every reasonable inference in favor of the uh, prevailing uh, plaintiff in, the, in a case like this one. We don't want them to do that because we want to decide as a matter of law that it can't be a proximate cause. Uh, but they've got some problems with that because the Texas Constitution gives final appellate jurisdiction to the courts of appeals over questions of fact, right? And what that means is that if you have a verdict that goes to the court of appeals, the court of appeals weighs the evidence and decides whether it's the great, against the great weight and preponderance of the evidence. And according to the Texas Constitution, their determination on that is final. It's a part of the equity jurisprudence of the uh, courts of appeals, and they did not extend that power to the Texas Supreme Court. Uh, in, uh, shortly after that, they rethought that Nixon. Remember the case Nixon versus Mr. Property Management? This is a very similar case, 1999. It happened here in Houston. A woman who was abducted by an HPD officer, taken to an unsecured garage, a very similar factual circumstance, and she's sexually assaulted. She sues the garage owner. There's uncontradicted evidence that there were many instances of crimes of violence in the garage against paid parkers. Uh, the Supreme Court says that not only, there's a new, they put a new element here, not only must the plaintiff show that it was foreseeable, the criminal act, but a new second element as well, that it was specifically foreseeable that this plaintiff or someone in her class was likely to be injured as a result. They said here it's foreseeable that employees using the garage might be assaulted, but not that someone might be assaulted after hours. Therefore, no duty is a matter of law. This is an interesting part. Justice, this was a three opinion case. Justice uh, Abbott wrote the plurality opinion. He looked at those Paul's graph things, foreseeability of duty, foreseeability of approximate cause. And he says, well, we, we want to follow Cardoza, the duty one. And then he says, but it doesn't really matter because it's the same test on both, even though the courts had put a lighter duty on foreseeability or lighter burden on foreseeability in the duty context and the approximate cause. Uh, result is that if the court wants to get rid of the case preemptively, they can grant a firm summary judgment on duty as a matter of law, or they can also decide that there should not have gone to jury on proximate cause as a matter of law. Uh, and then they decided in uh, 2005 that we really don't like that constitutional limitation on our ability to examine the facts in the case. So in an opinion by Justice Brister, city of Keller v. Wilson, he said, you know what, there really is no difference between a legal sufficiency and a factual sufficiency review. Now, I will tell you, I've read Justice Brister's opinion, and it's not completely illogical. It's well-written, it's well-reasoned, which uh, a lot of dangerous opinions are, I suppose. But if you follow his reason and his result, then we have a provision of the Constitution that makes no sense at all. What is the Court of Appeals' final jurisdiction over factual determinations? It simply doesn't exist. So anyway, here's the bottom line, and I wish I could come here, give you some practical ideas. These are gonna, how you're gonna get around these issues. But I really don't have those, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about here the, a few things that are going to happen to you. So the circumstantial evidence supports the inference uh, found by the jury as to causation that plaintiffs should be okay, right? I mean, you're going to support the reasonable inference. But wait, no, not if on appellate review the appellate court determines that some inference other than the one found by the jury was equally likely based on meager circumstantial evidence. This is a uh, Edwards versus Hammerly Oaks case, Mr. Peacock's case over there, I believe. 
so if the jury finds the defendant's conduct was a substantial factor in causing the event in question, uh, the plaintiff should be okay, right? We go back to Andrew's dissent. Uh, but wait, not if on appellate review that the appellate court determines the link uh, was too attenuated to, to constitute a substantial uh, factor. And these are the uh, suicide prevention cases. This was the first one, IHS Cedars Treatment versus Mason. Uh, they, they negligently discharged a psychiatric patient. Uh, he went into a rage and had a car accident. And they said, no, no, no. That's too attenuated. Even if it was foreseeable that it might do something like that, it's just too attenuated. We're not gonna let the jury get that. And it doesn't matter if you look at it on duty approximate cause, we're not gonna let the jury see that. So if the expert opines that the defendant's negligence was a substantial factor, you should be okay, because we do that, right? In medical malpractice cases, we ask them, was this a substantial factor? Yeah, but wait, no. Uh, not if the court determines that it was a conclusory opinion. That was an interesting case, this Ham case uh, from 2010. The security expert testified, again, it's an assault case, that extremely lax security measures failed to deter what would otherwise be a risk-averse assailant from entering the property. Sounds similar, Mr. Nixon, uh, property management. Was too conclusory because the plaintiff could not prove the assailant entered the property specifically at the area where security was lax. Uh, summary judgment affirmed by the uh, Dallas Court of Appeals, petition denied by the Texas Supreme Court. There's the German case, German, and I didn't put a slide on this, German versus Methodist Hospital, which I know anybody who does medical malpractice will be familiar with. In that case, we had a jury verdict here in Harris County against Methodist Hospital for the nurses' failure to intervene, failure to invoke the chain of command. And it goes up on appeal, the 14th Court of Appeals reversed and rendered uh, in part on the basis that, wait a minute, the surgeon said that even if the nurses had told him that he got it wrong, even if the nurses had told him that there was a problem here, that the doctor said he would have done the same thing anyway, so how could that be approximate cause? As a matter of law, a jury should never get the case. Unfortunately, we see that in an awful lot of cases. We have people who have their own interests to protect or who are willing to fall on the sword that'll say it wouldn't have made any difference. I think the bottom line is, you need to give a whole lot of thought to how you're gonna prove up proximate cause at the time of trial. You need to get your expert to say the things you wanna say, and you need to get them to say it two or three times. Thank you.